Hi, I'm Derek Jensen. This is Resistance Radio on the Progressive Radio Network. My guest today is Rachel Stewart. She's a writer slash journalist and current columnist with the New Zealand Herald, 2016 winner of the Opinion Writer of the Year at New Zealand's Canon Media Awards. Ex-agricultural leader turned dairy industry critic, falconer, protector of rivers, and everything wild. So first, thank you for your work in defense of the wild, and second, thank you for being on the program. Yeah, thanks for asking. So the first question is, um, can you just talk about the state of New Zealand rivers and threats to them? When, when, honestly, when somebody from the United States thinks about New Zealand rivers, we think of just pristine, beautiful, full of fish, and everybody's happy rivers. Um, so is that the case? No, sadly. Um, I think it has been the case. I think New Zealand is a country that has high expectations of itself in terms of the environment. Um, unfortunately, we've kind of drunk the Kool-Aid on that and, and believed our own bullshit around um, our tourism marketing. What's progressively happened and has now got to a, a, an absolute zenith is that the dairy industry is our, for many years, has been, well, decades, has been our biggest uh, earner, and now tourism has taken over. So those two don't actually do very well together because tourists do come here to see our wonderful rivers, of which we do still have some, but only in areas where dairy farming is not really happening. So maybe in the South Island with the high country, uh, lovely, beautiful rivers. But what's happening in most of the lowland rivers is the is the nitrates and nitrogen from fertilizer and cow effluent and more particularly their, their urine uh, is entering the waterways and has been doing it for decades but has now reached a point where we're losing 72% of our native fish have gone. Um, it's, it's actually a crisis, but it's a crisis that, like most governments and industry, fight every step of the way. I have made a name journalistically by taking that on. And when I started writing about uh, what was going on with our rivers and what was happening in the dairy industry, of which that is my background, my family were dairy farmers and sheep farmers. Uh, so what's happening is that they're putting all their might behind shutting us down from talking about it. And, you know, it is a big earner for New Zealand, and we are a small country. But let me put it in context. We've got four and a half no, – actually, we've reached five million people now. Uh, we have uh, we have something like eight million cows. So we have more cows than people. They produce 28 times more effluent uh, than humans a day, of course. And uh, what happens is there's no septic or sewerage uh, situation for that, so it's absolutely, absolutely just falling onto the ground. Then it rains or whatever, it goes down into the, into the, into the substrate and into the rivers uh, and pollutes them. And it's been happening for years. And in fact, they believe, scientists believe, freshwater scientists believe, um, and I live with one, uh, that uh, it's a, probably a lag time of 40 years before the worst hits. So we've got a situation right now in Canterbury where we have 1.3 million cows on the Canterbury Plains, which is a very shallow soil, uh, that's, they've just found E. coli in four rivers and the E. coli from cattle, from cows, uh, despite people saying, you know, the Federated Farmers, which is, you know, a national farm union, uh, saying, oh, well, it's probably human or it's probably birds or you know, the usual stuff, Derek, you know all about this stuff. So it's, um, it's an ongoing battle. I don't know how we're going to win it. Uh, I don't know that we will. But I, I think we have a situation where New Zealanders do hate it when our rivers are unswimmable. We have a history of summer days like today. I mean, it's Christmas Day in New Zealand today. A lot of people will be uh, out trying to swim in those rivers, and they can't anymore because they're getting sick. And that's when the wake-up call will start to happen, maybe when we lose somebody, because it's getting close. So that's the situation for us down here. Um, maybe it's partly because our tolerance for this thing, this thing where rivers aren't, you know, beautiful anymore. Um, and sometimes they look really beautiful, but of course you can't tell by looking. Um, that New Zealanders don't put up with this very well. So we're we getting to a point where maybe something may happen. We have a new government and, uh, they're a little bit more, ugh, well, they say better things about the environment. That doesn't mean anything really. Uh, hopefully the tide will turn, but it will take a death or two, I suspect. So that's the situation. So 
<laughs> I have a couple questions. One is, sure. um, and just save this one for later, um, that so often, so many journalists I encounter, um, there's this great line by um, William James, which is the, has, the press is the hired agent uh, set up by a money system. Let's see. The press is the hired agent of a moneyed system set up for no other reason than to tell lies where the interests are concerned. And mm -hmm. so often my experience of journalists who have not yet been fired is that they, they don't, they don't come on as, as strong as you do and instead they have to, uh, talk about, uh, how important the dairy industry is and, and mm -hmm. so this is for later because I want to ask you other stuff first, but I just want you thinking about this. It's like, how do you keep your job? And <laughs> so, so yeah. now back to the original, the, the question I really wanted to ask first though is you said something about 40 year lag time. And I'm, can you explain how that works? Because, okay, they poop on the ground and some of that turns yep. into soil, which is good. Some of it turns yep. into plants, which is good. Some of it runs off into rivers, which is bad. And now where do we get the 40 years? Well, because New Zealand's predominantly, and actually urine is the main problem, uh, although, you know, cow shit's not great, but urine is the main problem. Um, what happens is in, in industrial agriculture like we've got here and dairy farming is, you know, huge, we, 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 we're putting too much um, nitrogen fertilizer on. That's, that's another big problem. So it's years and years and years of that still coming down. You know, like we've got, Thousands, hundreds, and thousands, millions of acres of land that's being that, that's being used for years, and it's all got to filter through the soil, and that takes time. So the feeling is that, uh, it, and then there's the aquifers, of course, underground. So the feeling is that that lag time's still coming, that we have not seen the worst of it, and that's just basic uh, geography and basic uh, t time it takes for that stuff to carry on. If we stop dairy farming tomorrow, like completely, they still reckon we've got 40 years to go before we hit the worst. So that's what the scientists tell me. So it takes 40 years for the, um, the, the pollutants to filter, filter from the surface yeah. down to the aquifer. It can, yes. Okay. The worst is yet to come. Okay, so, so tell me a little bit more about the... Um, the, the dairy industry itself. You said the number of cows, but are these generally, when, when you say cows, are these, are these happy Guernseys, uh, kicking their heels up in fields, or yeah. are these, uh, I believe they're called CAFOs, the confinement animal factor? Oh no, farms? we don't do that here. To be, to be fair, that's part of the problem for New Zealand. Well, actually it's great for New Zealand. We do have a, I mean, you know, while I sound negative about the dairy industry, I also understand it very well. Uh, because I've, you know, it got me through life. Um, we have mostly Frisians and Jerseys, um, cows. We have, they are outside on the paddocks. We have very, very little, um, containment. We only have containment on sort of feed pads in very, very, um, uh, cold environments. And I think there's only very few. Mostly New Zealand cows are out all seasons on, you know, bucolic looking fields eating lush grass. Those bucolic fields, of course, are only there because of the amount of fertiliser that we use that we get from the Western Sahara and, you know, destroy people in the process of that. That's a whole other story. So we have this, um, we do have this situation where tourists do come here and they see this lovely industry and the cows walking gently towards the shed might be three miles. It used to be, you know, maybe... Um, Half a mile to walk to the shed. Now they, it is industrial now. It's bigger. Our, sh our, our milking sheds are bigger. Everything is massive. Uh, we are the biggest producers of milk in the world. We have the biggest dairy factories. Fonterra is our cooperative. It's the biggest in the world, pretty much. Um, uh, per capita, I mean, but in terms of scale. So we, it's, it's huge, but it, it still looks quite nice because it's outside and we still, you don't see the kind of the knocking the male calves on the head when when they're born because they're no use and so you kill them um, because they take up too much milk to feed so you might as well just knock them off you know though that's the kind of the other side of this industrial thing plus the fact that we bring in masses of palm oil uh, uh, PKE palm kernel expeller we're the biggest importers of that that comes from obviously where you destroy your orangutan habitats 
we are we we do it as a supplementary feed and of course when you're bringing in supplementary feeds you're not doing it on your own property you're beholden to the industrial model so we, we it's all done it's all done in a way that still looks kind of nice to, from the outside looking in but it just is not yeah and and to be clear um I mean, I'm sorry for my ignorance of New Zealand, but uh, were the ruminants don't belong in New Zealand, do they? Or, or are there native ruminants? No, no, there's no native ruminants. They don't belong right here, no. Just like anywhere else, just industrial farming. Yeah. So, so it's interesting because the, the problem... I don't want to put words in your mouth, so I'm going to say something, and please disagree if this is incorrect. Sure. So sure. The, the problem is not... That, that they're doing a strictly industrial model where you have you know ten thousand hogs confined in this area of a, you know a couple of football yeah. fields and the poop is is directly outside. The the problem is, I guess, finish that sentence. Scale. The problem is too many. The problem is the size of it. We have a country that you know is small and it's. Uh, Ge- geologically uh, very young and uh, it's we have lots of uh, empty spaces and we're filling them up with where we would naturally normally have sheep you know we had sheep for years and it does it does not do the damage that dairy does so it's the scale we've gone from you know uh, 15 years ago one and a half million cows maybe that was and certainly when I grew up we, we you know I was born in 1962 uh, the um we had a small dairy farm with like six bales. It was a walk-through shed, very old. Uh, that we had never had more than 100 cows. I think my father got to 99 and never went over 100. I'm not saying it was idyllic, but it was kind of. And everything we had 80 acres, I think, on that um, on that bottom farm on the dairy farm, and it educated four kids and fed everybody. And you know, now we're talking about the average herd being something like 1600. But there are herds that, that are sitting at seven, 8,000 now, and they're owned by um, tribes even, you know, Maori tribes, and you know about that, you've been down here. So they will say, the indigenous people say, well, we do it better and we do it, you know, and that's fine, they can say that, but it's no different from anybody else doing it. So Naitahu, for instance, in the South Island in Canterbury have huge dairy farms going on with thousands and thousands of cows. So it's a, it's a it's it's greed. It's it's the usual it's the usual thing happening. Intensification. Um, so there's a huge push in New Zealand now, which I'm part of, particularly by Greenpeace actually down here, to educate people about regenerative and biological farming. And you know some farmers, to be fair, are hearing it and getting it and st- starting to realise if they were to destock and go back to a more natural system, and some are testing it and some are learning that actually they can make just as much money. So it is starting to happen. I think it'll be too little too late. But, yeah, it's the sheer scale of what we've done, and we've been encouraged, um, you know, Zealand farmers have been encouraged to do this. Of course, they're all beholden to the banks right now. The banks are nervous as hell because the economy is looking pretty dire and um, it, all around the world. So, yeah, it's, it's the usual thing, Derek, you know. Well, I was just going to say, so this sounds like, uh, if we just plugged in some different words, we could be talking about yeah. um, the Anything. transformation of small family farms into large corporate farms. Um, yes. Something that I've been hammering just lately because of legalization of marijuana is that it's the exact same thing with marijuana farming in Northern California where all the tiny farmers are being driven out and replaced with uh, huge conglomerates with block-sized greenhouses. Yeah. And this is just, it's the Luddites for crying out loud. This is, yeah. this is the transformation of, uh, artisanal, um, individual small family owned concerns with, with larger conglomerates. That's it. That's it. It's happening everywhere. I mean, New Zealand's a big, um, beer brewer, right? We do a lot of craft beer down here. Really interesting craft beer. Um, and of course, when they get to a certain scale and everyone's drinking the beer, um, you know, our huge breweries take over and buy them. So, you know, it's the same, you know, you can't get away from it. So let's go a slightly different direction for a second. And can you talk mm-hmm. about, um, well, I'm going to give you two choices again. You can choose whichever one you want. One is, can you talk about 
uh, some of some of who and what has been lost in terms of uh, the rivers. You said fish are down 70 percent. Can you talk a little bit about about what the rivers used to be like prior to all this? And the other question is an entirely different direction. Is there has been you have received at various points pushback from uh, the dairy industry, and I just I find including death threats, and I find it I've received death threats. I just find it both horrifying and fascinating how so often death threats are the go-to means of discourse when, especially when an economic entity is thwarted. So you can go either one of those or both of them. Okay, first, the rivers. Well, New Zealand has a lot of long finials um, and short finials, and they're found only here. Uh, I think you know a bit about that. Uh, we have white bait. Uh, we have things that are only found in New Zealand, native fish that are only found in New Zealand, short jawed kokapoo. We have some really interesting species. They're just on the way out, basically. And, of course, when rivers are polluted, uh, you find the invertebrates disappear, and then the whole situation gets um, gets very... Well, it starts to break down, so we're in that mode. 72% of our native fish are gone. That's according to one of our freshwater scientists recently. He keeps plugging this figure, so we know it's bad. Um, and there don't seem to be too many protections around them, and the government's not too worried because they're just fish, you know, and eels are ugly and all that stuff. Whereas, to me, they're taonga, they're treasure, they're precious. Um, so, yeah, big trouble there. The other are, they one, fresh, are they freshwater eels or are they anadromous? No, no, freshwater eels. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Does, does New Zealand have any anadromous fish? Well, when you say that, just to clarify, because I'm not that schooled up on that word. Like salmon uh, go to the ocean and then they come back, and in the United States there, and in Europe too, a lot of eels will go to the ocean and then they come up to spawn. So it's freshwater spawning. It's freshwater, water. but at the end, yeah, it, it's freshwater for about 80 years. If a, if a female eel can live to 80 at the end of her life. She then goes to somewhere around Tonga and, and, uh, has her, has her, you know, spawns and then dies. And then they, those, those, um, elvers come back up virtually to the same rivers that she left. How they know that? It's an absolute mystery. If you look up about New Zealand long finials, they are an absolute treasure. The thing that it is beyond comprehension that they know to go to this area in Tonga, no one's actually ever found it, where it actually is. They travel miles, if they thousands of miles if they make it, well, hundred, no, thousands to Tonga. Then they do the thing, and then those, the one, the elvers, the, the babies that survive, come back up to those same rivers. But wow. she, she dies at the end of 80, 70 to 80 years. Her eyes start to turn blue, because I've had them out the back of my place, and they kind of, you know, feed them, and um, and then, you know, when we were growing up, we had eels that lived there my whole childhood and then left when they were around 80. And, you know, I can remember my mother being upset that they're gone. And, you know, and their eyes go a sort of a funny blue and then suddenly they disappear. And they're, they're all heading up to Tonga. Or, but they do it at the end of their life, which I found fascinating. And then they give birth, they do this thing, and then they, and then they just die. Their stomach just empties out and they just end up starving to death and die. It's bizarre. And what did it's you feed? Great. What did you feed them when you were a kid? Oh, we fed them meat, like leftovers from roasts or um, anything disgusting. They love it, you know. <laughs> and how big? Any, oh, huge! I mean, I've got. Oh, let me think. Um, we talk in terms of meters, but let me think in feet. Maybe either way, you get either way. Okay, um, you can get eels that are three, four meters long. Four meters long. Yeah. So that's like and that's like 15 feet, 13 feet. That has we have photos of those eels around, particularly years years ago. Not so much now because they die a lot early now because we're running out of them. And they're fat. I mean, they are fat. And you would not want to go in there with blood on you because they will. I mean, I've been in situations where they've started um, attacking me and start writhing around on your leg. And they're incredible animals. I I adore them. People think I'm nuts, but I love them. Yeah, and those huge. those are. Those are one of the fish getting hammered. Oh yeah, they just they're on the way out, you know. Long fin eels, New Zealand long fin eel. Um, the short fin eels, they're a bit smaller. They got a different area where the fin is, obviously, and they're doing a bit better. But um, the long fin eels are definitely in big trouble. And yeah. do these long fin eels, do, do they not reproduce until they're eighty? Round about, yeah. They so think they have about to live uh, eighty years before they. Yeah. Well, no, no wonder they're getting hammered. Yeah. 
Yeah, they're not getting. And of course, that's right. They can't. They get. And of course, people. F- See, what's interesting is that um, Maori fish them, and they have indigenous rights to eels. That's fine, and and they have a quota system. But actually, they are voluntarily um, stopping fishing to give them a break. They they're actually some tribes are voluntarily giving them a break, which Pakeha white New Zealanders are not doing. We just keep doing it for. You know, this is what gets me, Derek, is that the long finial, this precious, this precious treasure, only found here, is then used for pet food in Japan. You know, and and it's got this beautiful life, this cycle of life that they, that that we will send it to Japan and they use it for pet food and they eat it too, but they use it for pet food. And I find that absolutely appalling. Yeah. Well. I mean, it's appalling that we even eat them really anymore. But, you know, this is happening to so many things. So it's, that's, so that's what's going on in our rivers. In terms of the second I'm, question. I'm guessing, I'm sorry, I'm guessing too, just from yeah. what I know, I live just north of the Klamath and, yeah. uh, the prior to conquest, the Klamath would, would literally be quote black and roiling with salmon. And yes. I've yes. seen pictures of lampreys. Lampreys are eel-like yes. fish. And I've seen pictures of lampreys that, that they're so thick that like a rock is covered to, to a foot and a half with lampreys. That's and right. I'm, I'm guessing, I could easily be wrong, but I'm guessing that prior to conquest, the, the eels were pretty much the same, that they were, you yeah. know, you, if you go to a river, the chances are really good you're going to see a bunch of eels. Oh gosh, yes. I mean, there were times when I've heard stories from, you know, relatives that, you know, you know, a hundred years ago kind of stuff that you'd just go into any old lake and it was just, it was just pouring, just black, shiny bodies just going all over each other, just, you know, and you could always feed eels too because they always love meat. So they come up to you. They're easy to catch. And, you know, if you can get them like that and it's just, yeah, everything's changed. It's, um, yeah, New Zealand was exactly the same. I've, I've been to the Klamath actually. I've, I've, um, spent a bit of time in there and I c- came through where you, you, you live, Crescent City and, um, a couple of years ago, and um, it's a lovely area. That Klamath River is beautiful. Yeah, and unfortunately, I believe it was two years ago for the first time the Indians were, they had their standard Klamath Salmon Festival, but there weren't any salmon. Right. Um, yep. Anyway, so right. so so let's let's jump in the death, death threat direction. Right. Ah, uh, yeah, I've had a lot. I've had a lot. Um, it, you know, the problem for me now is that I'm inured to it, and I don't think that's necessarily healthy. I have had so many death threats in the last eight years or so since I've been writing that um, about these issues that I just don't even doesn't even really register. But I have had them come onto the property and leave leave me notes, and I've been left a note and I've had cow shit delivered into the middle of the driveway so I couldn't get out and uh, did did see the guy that did that, so the police talked to him. But, um, yeah, that's toned down a bit now. It's almost like when I started writing about dairy issues in 2010, I it, it was quite radical, and I think that I was used by a provincial newspaper that I started with as the kind of the whack job that they could all laugh at, you know, because it was such a big dairying area. So when I started talking about these issues, and I've never changed tack, I just keep going, um, they just thought, well, well, she's got a good style of writing, and we and we like her, and they knew who I was, and but it was getting so much, uh, I was getting so much hate that I think they thought, oh, this is good, you know. So that's how I've kept my job initially, and then what happened was I think some of the things that I predicted started just unraveling before everyone's eyes, and I started to, started to be taken a lot more seriously, even though I'm still hated by the deer industry. There's a grudging respect there though. Um, and uh, then I won this award, which everyone was absolutely shocked at. Um, and it suddenly elevated me into the big leagues in terms of the New Zealand Herald, which, you know, has a million readers every day. So, um, which is nothing in the American scale, but here it's quite big. So I think I don't, it is a, it is a, this death threat, rape threat thing, it's just so, empty and meaningless to me now. It doesn't mean it would never happen, but I actually suspect, and I'm sure you do too, that if someone's going to kill me, they're not going to, um, you know, broadcast it to the world first. So I kind of just pretty relaxed about it. You know, I've I've received a, a boatload of death threats over the, the the decades too, and it 
and I have lots of friends who have, and it just, it always, I guess the thing that, that, that just strikes me as weird is that, yeah, there are plenty of foresters whom I hate, and there are plenty of, you know, fisheries biologists who are on the wrong side and who are signing off on destructive mm -hmm. timber sales, and I hate them, and honestly, if I saw them in town, I, I don't know, pretend not to notice them or something, but it yeah. would never occur to me to send them no. a death threat, and and the point is, this is, you know, basically every activist I know has has encountered this. I just find, well, and see, here's another thing that's really weird too is is something that changed my perspective on receiving death threats was when I learned that professional baseball players get death threats too. And it's like for crying um, out loud, if you're going to send a, a death threat to a professional athlete, then yeah, and you're anyways, I don't, Yeah, and it's just it just I guess I guess the thing that's striking me is that that. It's just an extraordinary thing that we that that if you express an opinion that uh, someone doesn't like, and especially an opinion that goes against the way they make their living, it's just it just does strike me that death threats are are, are almost standard. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. And what we're finding now with the with the lack of free speech that we're encountering from, you know the woke left, I guess, if you want to put it any other way, uh, is that free speech is kind of... I mean, you know, if I don't like someone's opinion, I just kind of don't read it or don't even... I just go, oh, yeah, and carry on. I just don't... Un I, I, it's beyond me that we can't have these conversations. Yeah. Yeah, and, you know, again, it doesn't matter whether the issue we're talking about is, um, you know, the transgender issue, which both you and I have been embroiled in, or whether it's dairy or whether it's logging, it seems that there is just that there's a standard response, which is, um, okay, so it's time for me to come to your house and kill you. <laughs> yeah. I think everyone <laughs> thinks that we're just big, um, you know, we're just big pussies who, you know, that environmentalists are just big pansy type people who are going to be scared off by um, a threat of death. I mean, you know, I'm one of the toughest people I know because having to take on the, and you are too, I mean, my God. We're taking on the biggest, the biggest earners in the country. We're taking on massive um, vested interests, and um, I think do, that, do they really think we're scared of them? I just I, it's beyond my comprehension. That does not scare me. What scares me is the end of the world, the end of the world as we know it in terms of, you know, humanity, you know, hurtling to its doom. That scares me. But um, well, actually, it doesn't. I've probably got used to that too. But I'm not scared of humans, you know, threatening me, that's the least of my concerns, really. So, mm -hmm. let's let's do talk. I don't know if this is a fair question, and if it isn't, you can say so. But okay. I, I know some people have said that I am courageous for writing the stuff I do, and I never feel courageous. I just feel like I get stuck in the... I'm, I'm, I'm writing along, and it's just... Oh, this is what's true, and I'm just sort of following it like a dog following a scent. And yeah. um, yet, it's also true that I know there are a great number of journalists and others who definitely keep their heads down. You mentioned earlier a uh, water expert who puts his head above the parapet. Mm -hmm. And I guess what can, what is it that causes that causes you to write truth about the dairy industry and might cause someone else to not put their head above the parapet and I'm asking this because all of my work is about trying to get people to on whatever their issue is put their head above the parapet so what can you say to people that will encourage them to to stand up for what they think is right. Do you see what I'm trying to get at? Yeah, I do, yeah. I think, look, I have many journalist colleague, colleagues that disappoint me every day. Um, sometimes I tell them that they do. I recently signed a... New Zealand has been the first country to... Um, recently, our new Prime Minister, Jacinda Ardern, has... Um, we've banned all new permits for exploration. 
So the ones that are already going are going to expire, but there's no more oil exploration happening off the coast of New Zealand now. We, we've been the first to do it. Now, in some ways that could be meaningless. I don't know, but I signed a, an open letter um, that Greenpeace organised to to encourage the government to do this, and we won, and it's happened, and we've been lauded around the world for this because it's quite a it's quite a statement, really. Um, and I'm proud that New Zealand's done that. So I had it. I had some journal, and I, I was the only journalist apart from one other um, who I encouraged to do it, and she agreed with me that we just had to do it. We had a lot of knowledge about that industry and oil and what it's been doing, fracking and all that stuff. And we just felt we had to do it. And I asked other journalists about it who I really admire, who write really good stuff, and mostly it's to do with social justice and things that, you know, it's not my bag, but it's theirs. And I said, why didn't you, why don't you sign this? Because, you know, why, why can't we have more people doing this? And to a person, they said, well, we just want to keep, a, a, we want to keep balance. We want to keep being respected. And I said, so that means I'm not? And they said, well, you know, you do your thing, we do ours, but I want to keep balanced about it. And I just said to them, I just don't have any respect for that. You know climate change is happening. You know what's going on. We we all know. None of us disagree on that. Oh, well, no, just couldn't do it. I think it comes down to just, it comes down to people wanting to, they consider that if they're, in, particularly journalists, sitting there being absolutely balanced about every bloody thing is, you know, they think it's wonderful and great and they'll be respected for it. I don't. I mean, I am literally an opinion writer. Um, not always, but mostly. So I guess it gives me a bit of leeway. But I still, I don't think their employers would have told them off for it. I really don't. I think that, uh, I think it comes down to personality types. In my opinion, most people hate conflict and they will keep their head down. And it's to do with their jobs, maybe, but I think partly it's because they just don't want to be seen to be out there changing anything. And, of course, that is a, that is an indicator of where we're all heading because we've all sat back and not put our heads – well, not us, you and I haven't, but many people have – and not put our heads above the parapet. And here we are in the situation we are planetarily, which is dire. So I don't understand it. I think for me – um, I was farming, we got flooded, we lost everything in 04, 2004. It came to, it came to the roof, people were rescued off the roofs with helicopters. I watched cattle flowing down the streams, you know, dying, heading out to sea, it was massive. And that was my wake up call. Something happened in that moment that made me think about things. And I've always been, I guess I've always been a person who questions everything and I've always been a little bit outside the box, but that was the moment I realised that I needed to change my thinking. Well, I didn't even think I read it. I just did change my thinking about climate. And then I started reading and reading and reading and reading and educating myself and I just suddenly went from being kind of, you know, like most people just kind of accepting the way life is to, to seeing things that once you've seen them, you can't unsee them. And so here we are. You know, and I don't have, like you, I just go down this track and I, I know what I know and I know what I see and I write about that. And there's no other way, you know, I've got to go down fighting and we're all going to die and I want to be remembered as someone who had a go at it and tried to change the way that we see all of capitalism, all of um, the relationship between humans and the environment. I, I went from farming, you know, a whole farming background to, to not being able to send anything off to slaughter anymore in the industrial model. So that was a major shift, and I am glad I woke up. It's, so a lot of people just haven't got there yet, Derek, I think. Yeah, and, you know, for me, one of the things I think about a lot is um, if I were – for me, a lot of it has to do with shifting your loyalty away from the economic system and to the natural world. That yes. once once I switched my loyalty, um, everything else just became everything else is followed. Everything else becomes pretty straightforward. And then all I have to do is think, okay, if I'm going to write a piece uh, about the dairy industry and rivers, if the river could actually take be be pounding on a keyboard. Yeah. Or could be holding a pen, what would the river say? And exactly. that guides every everything I write. Me too. Me too now. Absolutely. And it's it's an extraordinary change. Um 
Yeah, and money is just, you know, I guess I've always had a sort of, my relationship to money has always been, was always quite complicated before, and now it's really simple. Um, you're right, it's not about the monetary system. It's not about, I, I have to look in the mirror, you know, and so I don't do anything for money that I, I don't do anything for money that I can't live with. If my editor said to me tomorrow, look, you've got to stop talking about this or you've got to stuff it, you know, just tone it down, or and he, and he doesn't do that, um, I just wouldn't do it. I'd just walk. You know, because I'd find another way to, you know, make money somehow. It's just what's happened to me. And it's, look, it's made it, it's made it look difficult in some ways, but it's opened up doors that I never thought were ever there before. And, you know, I worship nature. That's, that's, this is my religion, you know. This is my religion and I'm going to stick to that. I, I'm a, I believe that the natural world is, is really all we've got and we have to, it's precious and we have to look after it. And that was a massive change for me. And, yeah, it's an epiphany, really. It's it is like finding a, a new religion in a way. Although, yeah, it's kind of not like a religion in the traditional sense, but it just it was an epiphany, and I just my eyes opened, and it was a massive change for me, and I'm really glad I had it. Well, for me, it is it it is a religion, and yeah, and I'm comfortable saying that because um, a religion is supposed to teach us, I believe, how to live how to live together and how to live in place and it's also supposed to teach us how to experience the divine yes in whatever that means and just from your little description i don't mean to put words in your mouth but it seems to me that you can perceive the divine in those eels yes. and um so for me at least when when the problem with a lot like Christianity is that you've got this distant sky god. One of the many problems, but one of the problems is a distant sky god, and that's not going to really teach you how to experience the divine in a redwood forest. Mm. And and you know the divine has to be here in the trees and in the in the eels and in everybody else. That's right. Um, so let's go back to dairy for a minute and 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 go back to just almost policy. So if they, if they made you the uh, the what are they called Zarina? If they made you the Czar, if they made you the the king or queen, the queen of all things dairy in New Zealand. Yeah, the agricultural minister, the minister of agriculture. Yep. Yep. So you're your minister of agriculture appointed tomorrow, and the rule is you cannot in the first three months get rid of capitalism. So you have to continue the the framing conditions that we have. I mean, we all know that if you could, you know, if we want, if we, if if we really want to save the planet, we have to get rid of industrial civilization. You can't do that right now. You, that's that's like two years down the road. Okay. Um, I guess I would have a better. I would work out a system of regulations that worked because the people that regulate the dairy industry are called regional councils. Um, they're probably they they basically don't seem to do that. They seem to work for the dairy industry. So. I would make them accountable and I would make them make the dairy industry accountable in terms of leaching. So by leaching, I mean the amount of nitrate. You can work out pretty closely how many cows on what sort of um, land under what conditions uh, are leaching into the environment. So you'd, you'd work on tightening those controls. Then after a few months, I'd say, now, by, we're going to make you destock. You're going to, you're going to shed, first of all, 20% of your stock. Sorry about this. We're going to compensate you maybe a little bit, but not to the extent that you think you're going to get. Um, and then we're going to progressively over time maybe destock another 20% the year after and then another, you know, and then to the point where we get to maybe 50% of the national herd. Um, there would be some incentives along the way because I'm not naive enough to think that you can't uh, make farmers, that you can make farmers do something without some financial um you know, uh, subsidies, because that's what they are. Uh, so there'd be a number of things. But I would then look at investing very heavily in uh, biological regenerative farming so that everybody has to be able to make hay or silage or feed from their own properties. So I guess we'd be, I'd be putting a massive in, in, effort and energy into biological farming. So that would be basically the framework that I would be working in. And, you know, an idea I had several years ago was that uh, if I were, you know, made in charge of soil across the country, 
one of the things I might do is uh, uh, measure the soil on everybody who has more than, let's say, I don't know, a thousand acres, five thousand acres, yeah. some some yeah. fairly large amount of properties. So you're not worried about somebody who has an acre. Um, er, you basically test the soil every five years, and if the soil is not both deeper and healthier on its own terms, then the land is seized. Right. Cool. Um, that's that's yeah. a that's a. And of that's course, radical. This would last, that's and radical. This, t- <laughs> this, this, this plan would last about three minutes before my head would be on a pike. That's um, dead right. Yeah. I mean, I'd love to say the same thing, but, you know, we know it's pretty much unworkable. But, yes, yes, I agree. Yeah, so my point is in terms of the regenerative farming, that, that you know, if you're going to do farming, that's the way to go. Absolutely. There's no other way to go. We, You know, New Zealand's got this idea that we're supposed to feed the planet, and we do. We do feed the planet. It's a myth. We're not here to feed the planet. We're here to feed ourselves, you know. Globalization is, is, is this ridiculous construct now. We, we really have to shut the gates and feed ourselves. So we need to, yeah. It, look, if we don't get to the, if we co- don't cut to the chase soon, it'll be, we'll get there because we'll be forced to. And we won't, there'll be no globalization in a very short period of time, I don't think, you know. Which will be great for the eels because I, yes. I learned this several years ago when I was talking with somebody from Canada who used to see four or five grizzly bears every single day yeah. and now saw a grizzly bear every month. And the reason was because uh, farmers, I'm sorry, uh, hunters had discovered the market for bear gallbladder in China. Mm-hmm. And the point is that if you can, is that global demand, even for something as esoteric as a bear gallbladder, um, no natural population, no matter how strong, can support infinite demand. No. And that's what global global marketplace creates. Is, I mean, for crying out loud, you get you end up sending sending eels to to Japan and gallbladders to to China and yeah. and oil to New Zealand. That's right. It's crazy. It's just it, insane. It's insane. And it's unsustainable, and it will end. And uh, I'm looking forward to that day. Yeah. I am too. And, you know, all of my work, so I'm going to ask you what all your work is about. All of my work is really predicated on one premise, which is this way of life cannot last. And when it comes down, I would prefer that there is more of the world left than less. That's pretty yeah. much it. Yeah. Yeah, that's all we can hope for, really, I think. Logically, I agree. Yeah. And so tell people just a little bit more about your work. How can they read your work? How can they learn more about about you? And um, how can they help you in your struggle against uh, the the destruction of rivers by dairy farms? <laughs> um, how they can help me? Well, read me. Yeah, read me is good. I mean, you can find me on, in the New Zealand Herald, Rachel Stewart. It's all there. Um, Google, it's around. Um yeah, it'd be great if um, I, you know, I'm getting a larger overseas audience now because we're a pretty small country, and um, the stuff I'm writing about is pretty global in many ways. Um, but you know, of course, I live here, so I have a vested interest in this place. I love this place; it's my home. But I love the planet, you know. So it's um, yeah, people can help. I, for me, everything about my work is once I realise the interconnectedness um, I mean you know it in farming to be fair, you sort of do know about interconnectedness because you know that what you do in, down that paddock is going to affect something in this paddock and you can only do so much on your own property and without um, ruining everything, so farmers do know that, they know it on some basic level and I think when I took that background and, and stepped up to be, you know a, a, more than an environmentalist, I'm a I don't know. I'm something more than that, but uh, it, it, it 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 runs everything I write about. It runs everything I do. I discovered falconry too in the middle of all that, so that's a whole other subject. But hunting with birds and eagles, and you know, in America mostly, that's where I started doing it. So that interconnectedness there and being close to the wild informs everything I do. I guess I'm a little bit disappointed in humanity, and that would be the biggest understatement of this um, of this interview. Um, so what informs my work? I guess it's what you just said. It's the religion of, of the environment and nature. And I guess, yeah, you've convinced me, Derek. Um, I, this is my religion. I mean, I knew it, but I just, the New Zealand way is to kind of play it down and not say things like that. So no, this is my religion and I'm confirming that here today with you. 
Well, thank you so much for all of your tremendous work, and thank you for, for your writing, which I, I very, very much enjoy. And I would like to thank listeners for listening. My guest today has been Rachel Stewart. This is Derek Jensen for Resistance Radio on the Progressive Radio Network.